Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, Ashley and I will bring you stories along with Brian Lynn. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, visitors to the U.S. National Museum of the American Indian recently had a chance to buy artwork made by some of the world's finest Native American artists. The handmade objects included jewelry and clothing, as well as paintings and statues. They were offered to the public as part of a two-day Native art market at the museum's headquarters in Washington, D.C. One artist at the event was Porfirio Gutierrez. His ancestors belonged to the Zapotecs, an ancient group of people that lived in what is now southern Mexico. Gutierrez says he and his family create handwoven cloth by using the same methods as their ancestors. He describes the resulting textiles as functional art, influenced by the natural world. These ways of making colors and making an authentic uh, piece, it's disappearing. So I feel like I need to uh, contribute into the preservation and the only way to preserve it is to actually employ these old ways of making the arts. Gutierrez's work was among the hundreds of objects on sale at the Native American art event. They represent traditional and modern works by more than 30 Native artists from across North America. Like Gutierrez, Many of the artists said that nature is a big influence on their artwork. For example, Jane Myers uses teeth and bones from animals for some of her jewelry. Each elk has two ivory teeth, so I do these necklaces, and then I also have buffalo bone beads. I try to use all the same items that we used as uh, traditional Native people 200 years ago. Artist Kathleen Wall uses clay from the ground around Jemez Pueblo in New Mexico to make dolls. She paints one doll at a time, giving each one a peaceful facial expression. The National Museum of the American Indian has been holding the art market each year since 2006. Hayes Lavis is head of cultural arts at the museum. He says he hopes visitors leave with a better understanding of Native people in the Americas. But we're hoping that people will take away from this experience is just a realization of the contributions of Native people to the Americas. They were here first, they've always been here, they've gone through a lot of adversity, and they are still thriving, strong, creative cultures. Naaman was known for being very careful about how he spent his money. But even those closest to him had no knowledge of the fortune he quietly gathered and the last act he had planned. Naaman died of cancer 
at age 63 last January. The man from the American state of Washington gave most of his money to groups that help the poor, sick, disabled, and abandoned children. He gave them $11 million. The large amount of his fortune shocked the groups that received his gifts, and even his best friends. That is because Naaman had been known to repair his own shoes with duct tape. He had sought deals to buy food from grocery stores at closing time, and had taken friends out to lunch at low-cost restaurants. Naaman died unmarried and childless. He loved children but also was intensely private, his friends say. He saved, invested, and worked extra jobs to gather money. He rarely spent the money on himself after seeing how unfair life could be for children who suffer the most. His friends believe a lifelong desire to help his older brother, who had a developmental disability, influenced Naaman. Yet he rarely spoke of it. His brother died in 2013. His close friend Susan Madsen told the Associated Press, Growing up as a kid with an older disabled brother kind of colored the way he looked at things. A former banker, Naaman worked for the past 20 years at the State Department of Social and Health Services. He earned $67,234 a year and also took on side jobs. Sometimes he worked as many as three jobs at a time. He saved and invested enough to make several millions of dollars. He also received millions more from his parents after they died, said Shashi Karan, a friend from his banking days. Naaman was pleased when he was able to make use of the reduced prices many companies and organizations offer older people. He bought his clothes from large self-service stores. He loved cars, but for most of his life, he drove worn-out vehicles. After Naaman's death, Karin recognized how little he knew about his longtime friend. I don't know if he was lonely. I think he was a loner, Karin said. Many of the organizations that received Naaman's gifts said they did not know him, although they had crossed paths. He left $2.5 million to the Pediatric Interim Care Center in Washington. The center is a private organization that cares for babies born to mothers who abused drugs and children with drug dependency. Naaman had called the center about a newborn baby while working for the state more than 10 years ago. Barbara Drennan, who established the center, said, We would never dream that something like this would happen to us. I wish very much that I could have met him. I would have loved to have had him see the babies he's protecting. The center used the money to pay off its mortgage and buy a new vehicle to transport the children. Naaman gave $900,000 to The Treehouse, a foster care organization. He had brought children in his care to the group's house, where children without parents can choose toys and necessities for free. Treehouse is using Naaman's money to expand its college and career support services statewide. Jessica Ross, who works with Treehouse, commented that Naaman's savings and cost-cutting were for this purpose. She called it a pure demonstration of philanthropy and love.
Many high school students in the United States get hands-on training in construction skills by building real houses. One such program was created for construction and design students in Waterloo, Iowa. The students have already received training in many areas of house construction. They have put up walls, built windows and doors, and completed some wiring. The project is run by the Waterloo Career Center. The center offers students different programs designed to prepare them for careers in technical fields. Students from the Waterloo Community School District recently took part in construction training that centered on the skill of masonry, work done with stone, brick, or concrete materials. The students spent five days at their school learning from experienced workers from the Masonry Institute of Iowa, a professional organization. The workers taught the students how to mix mortar and build walls with bricks and blocks. One of the goals for the students was to build a pier, a solid support built to hold vertical pressure. It usually goes out from land and into water. The students moved the mortar onto pieces of wood and then added bricks and blocks to form walls. Hunter Pierce was one of the students taking part. He told the Waterloo Cedar Falls Courier newspaper that using the right amount of material is a very important part of the process. You put a lot of mortar there so you have a lot of contact, just so in a couple of years it doesn't fall apart, he said. Chris Bush helped oversee the students' efforts. He told the newspaper that learning such skills will help the students be able to build their own solid structures later in their careers. Bush said that in this kind of hands-on setting, students can learn exactly how much mortar is needed to create a safe wall. He explained that the right mortar level for the student's peer project should be about one centimeter. The students started the pier by putting five blocks in place. They finished the project by putting bricks and mortar on the outside to complete the look. As the students worked, Bush offered them an important piece of advice. He told the students to be sure to use a leveling tool to check that the wall stands straight and level. It's fun. It's something to do, West High student Nathan Elliott told the Waterloo Cedar Falls Courier. He added that this kind of learning is much better than sitting at a computer. I like the hands-on stuff, he said. Other students also said they liked this method of learning. Some said it got them excited about future careers in construction. These are the kinds of comments Chris Bush likes to hear during his training activities at schools. This is basically part of our recruitment, he said. However, he knows that no matter how good their training experience is, not every student will end up working in masonry. Bush adds that bringing the program into schools is an important way to find the next generation of workers. This is great having a whole week in here to present masonry to kids, he said. I'm Brian Lynn. Welcome to The Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. 
The national election of 1832 put Andrew Jackson in the White House for a second term as president. One of the major events of his second term was the fight against the Bank of the United States. In 1836, the bank's charter ended and the Treasury Department took responsibility for most of the government's finances. Many people considered Jackson's bank veto one of the most important actions of his presidency. Another major event of Andrew Jackson's second term as president involved Texas. The United States had given its claim to Texas to Spain in 1819. Then Mexico won its independence from Spain in 1821. After that, Texas belonged to Mexico. During the 1820s, Americans poured into Texas. Most of the settlers came from the states of Tennessee, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Many owned slaves and brought the slaves with them to Texas. American settlers in Texas were able to buy land for almost nothing, but they had to promise to join the Roman Catholic Church. They also had to promise to obey the laws of Mexico. Over time, Mexican leaders saw the danger of continuing to permit Americans to settle in Texas. The Mexican government sent an official to inspect conditions along the border with the United States. The official reported that as he traveled north through Texas, he saw less and less that was Mexican and more and more that was American. He said there were very few Mexicans in some towns, and these Mexicans, he said, were extremely poor. He said the American settlers were not becoming true Mexicans. They were not speaking Spanish. They were not becoming Catholics, and they were not accepting Mexican traditions. The official said the situation in Texas could throw the whole Mexican nation into revolution. He urged Mexico to send troops to occupy Texas. The situation between the settlers and the Mexican government became increasingly tense. For the most part, there was little that President Andrew Jackson could do. The United States had a friendship treaty with Mexico. The government in Washington had a duty to remain neutral. In April 1833, the settlers in Texas held a convention. They prepared a list of appeals to the leader of Mexico, General Santa Ana. One of the Americans, Stephen Austin, carried the appeals to Mexico City. He spent six months negotiating with the Mexican government. General Santa Ana promised to honor all the requests except one. He would not make Texas a Mexican state, although he said that might be possible someday. Stephen Austin was satisfied. He left the Mexican capital to return to Texas. On his way home, to his surprise, Austin was arrested. He was arrested because of a letter he had written earlier. He had written it when his negotiations with Mexican officials seemed to be failing. He had said, it might be best if the people declared Texas an independent state. Austin was put in prison in Mexico City for a year and a half. 
Stephen Austin urged the people of Texas to remain loyal to Mexico. But talk of rebellion had already begun. The settlers were calling themselves Texans. In November 1835, representatives from all parts of Texas held a convention to discuss the situation. They had no plans to take Texas out of the Mexican Republic. In fact, a proposal to do that was defeated by a large vote. However, the Texans took action to protect themselves against Santa Ana, who had declared himself dictator. They organized a temporary state government. They also organized a state army, and they made plans for another convention. Before the Texans could meet again, Santa Ana led an army of 7,000 men across the Rio Grande River into Texas. The first soldiers reached San Antonio on February 23rd. The Texas forces withdrew to an old Spanish mission church called the Alamo. On March 1st, the second Texas convention opened. This time, the representatives voted to declare Texas a free, independent, and sovereign republic. They wrote a constitution based on the Constitution of the United States. They created a government. David Burnett became president. Sam Houston was to continue as commander of Texas forces. On the second day of the convention, a letter came from the Alamo in San Antonio. The letter was addressed to the people of Texas and all Americans. The commander of Texas forces at the Alamo, Lieutenant Colonel William Barrett Travis, wrote, I am besieged by a thousand or more of the Mexicans under Santa Ana, I have sustained a continual bombardment and cannonade for 24 hours and have not lost a man. The enemy has demanded a surrender at discretion, otherwise the garrison are to be put to the sword if the fort is taken. I have answered the demand with a cannon shot, and our flag still waves proudly from the walls. I shall never surrender or retreat. The letter from the Alamo closed with the words, Victory or Death. Representatives at the convention wanted to leave immediately to go to the aid of the Texans at the Alamo. But Sam Houston told them it was their duty to remain and create a government for Texas. Houston would go there himself with a small force. The help came too late for the 189 men, perhaps even more, at the Alamo. The defenders included some Tejanos, or Hispanic Texans, and the famed frontiersman Davy Crockett. Santa Ana's forces captured the mission on March 6th. When the battle ended, not a single one of the defenders was still alive. Sam Houston ordered all Texas forces to withdraw to the Northeast, away from the Mexican army. One group of Texans did not move fast enough. Santa Ana trapped them. He said the Texans would not be harmed if they surrendered. They did. One week later, they were marched to a field and shot. Only a few escaped to tell the story. Santa Ana then moved against Sam Houston. He was sure his large army could defeat the remaining Texas force. President Andrew Jackson and Sam Houston were close friends. When told of Houston's retreat, the president pointed to a map of Texas. He said, 
If Sam Houston is worth anything, he will make his stand here. Jackson pointed to the mouth of the San Jacinto River. The Battle of San Jacinto began at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. There were about 800 Texans. There were twice as many Mexicans. The Mexicans did not expect the retreating Texans to turn and fight, but they did. Shouting, remember the Alamo, the Texans ran at the Mexican soldiers. 18 minutes later, the battle was over. Santa Ana's army was destroyed. On May 14th, 1836, Texas President David Burnett and General Santa Ana signed a treaty. The treaty made Texas independent from Mexico. Historian Daniel Feller says, President Jackson had to be careful when responding to the situation in Texas. Whether or not Jackson approved of the insurrection in Texas, whether or not he saw it as complicating or easing the path toward eventual assimilation of Texas, there's no doubt that he wanted Texas as part of the United States. Jackson did not want Mexico to blame the United States for the revolution, even though the American government had been trying to buy Texas for many years. Jackson believed the country should spread as far west as it could. But he also worried that giving statehood to Texas would deepen the split between the northern and southern states. Texas would be a state where slavery was permitted. For this reason, the anti-slavery leaders in the North strongly opposed Texas statehood. Jackson told a representative from Texas, William Horton, that there was a way that statehood for Texas would bring the North and South together instead of splitting them apart. Jackson said Texas should claim California. The fishing interests of the North and East, said Jackson, wanted a port on the Pacific coast. Offer it to them, the president said, and they will soon forget that Texas is a slave state. Jackson and Wharton held this discussion just three weeks before the end of the president's term. Wharton spent much time at the White House. He also worked with congressmen, urging the lawmakers to recognize Texas. He was able to get Congress to include in a bill a statement permitting the United States to send a minister to Texas. This bill was approved four days before the end of Jackson's term. On the afternoon of March 3rd, 1837, Jackson agreed to recognize the new republic led by his old friend, Sam Houston. Nine years would pass before Texas became an American state. I'm Steve Ember, inviting you to join us next time for The Making of a Nation, American History from VOA Learning English. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.